Hello and welcome to Strange Stories. It's great to have you here. We are all about sharing stories of near-death experiences from around the world in the hopes of bringing some light and inspiration to your day. Our daily videos offer a glimpse into what lies beyond this life, and we believe that they can help us all appreciate the gift of life a little bit more. If you enjoy our content, please consider liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest videos. Your support means the world to us and helps us continue to grow. And to our returning viewers, welcome back. We're thrilled to have you with us again. So go ahead, grab a cozy blanket, get comfy, and join us for today's incredible near-death experience story. My name is Jacob Cooper. It gives me great pleasure to be here with you today to share my own near-death experience. That was roughly 30 years ago, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with hearing NDEs as an adult. But mine was a little unique. I had mine when I was a toddler, which happens far more frequently than you might think. It was September of 1993, so I was only 3 years old at the time, and I was going to a playground with family friends on that day. As I got out of the car and went into the playground, I began to have difficulty breathing. Now keep in mind, I didn't know this at the time, but I had whipping cough, also known as pertussis, which can be fatal and quite damaging in infants, children, and even small cases of adults. So I had this whipping cough at the time, and I went to the park, and then, when I was, you know, I started having a lot of trouble on the playground. I was breathing as I prepared to climb a ladder and slide, and as I reached the top of the ladder and slide, I began to suffocate, and I literally had no breath at the time. There was nothing I could hold on to or grab on to, and we think of breath as something we don't always notice and sometimes take for granted. And at this very moment, I realized that this is what kept me in this human body, but without it, I was in this strange place. So it wasn't quite in the body, but it wasn't quite over there, where I was in this strange place of torment and endless suffering and panic. During this time, I began to notice that my body was simply not working due to the lack of oxygen and not having my own breath. And then, moments later, as if you're in a car and the car that you're attempting to work and start, I decided to get out of the car and check out the engine to see what was going on. And then, in the disembodied state, I was able to really become more aware of not only my own body, but my own brain. Which in that moment, I recognized that my brain was slowly being deprived of oxygen. And then a couple moments later, I was aware of my brain and all the different functional components. Moments later, as a result of the lack of oxygen, I felt my brain literally snap in half with a large crack within my brain and a large snap. It felt like lightning or a thunderstorm, but it was just this large crack that I felt and so only as a saying goes when my brain cracked in half. That's when spirit and God entered and I felt myself racing into a tunnel into this very familiar light, going upwards and upwards to where there's no beginning, there's no middle, no end. The only way I can describe it is as a timeless euphoria. There were no limits to how good I felt or how high I soared in that moment. It was as if I were riding the fastest roller coaster with them on their most intimate journey. Moments later, I became aware of my body, specifically the right side of my body and the right side of my brain. I became aware of an incredibly immaculate palace which now I learned represents the creativity and wisdom that we get, the insight that we get. That was so lovely and bright. I almost had to shield myself from looking at it, but I was able to look at the palace and really hear this beautiful high-pitched angelic choir within it, and the light was so incredibly emanating in this disembodied state. I'll use the word God for convenience, but you could also use the word universe to refer to the center of the universe and the creator of all things. I've got some bad news for you. Whatever your vernacular is, it's very limited in terms of what it actually was. You know, words can be limiting, but this is the format that we have. And the moment I knew that I was really touching upon the centerpiece of self-creation and the pinnacle of reality from which all things emanate, which I guess we could refer to as God in our language. But it was beyond words for me. And then, a few moments later, I felt myself being enveloped in this beautiful unconditional love and I was aware of these colors which were almost bronze and gold in color and flashing in front of me at the time. I did not physically see Jesus Christ in front of me, but it was much deeper than that. I felt the consciousness of Christ itself in that moment. It's as if I was listening to a whisper or a vibration from the other side, and I believe we all exist beyond our own bodies or personalities. 
There is a consciousness beyond us, and I believe that's what tapped into the highest version of the consciousness that we view as Christ, and in that moment, I felt quite a sense of comfort, of a sense of enveloping in this love. You have to remember that I was still contemplating, you know, my body and being three years old and my parents and the life that I was going to live, and so there was an adjustment phase that was certainly happening in my NDE. So I was connected to a part of myself that was older than my three-year-old self. I was connected to my eternal soul, which is timeless and ageless and has an awareness that extends beyond our personalities that we have while incarnating in various bodies at various ages. So I say two things could be true at the same time that I realized I was a three-year-old. You know, Jake or Jacob, but also an awareness of my eternal soul, which was even more beyond the personality and chronological age and its developmental stage of that life that I was living. And in that instant, I was able to feel a sense of comfort in the clear recollection that all is well. All is well and will be well is the best way I could describe it. That was something we were used to, as Sue would say loudly. I was able to be in this timeless moment that I know the other side is non-linear and on the other side. All things are perfect just as they are and you're enveloped in an incredible unconditional love that looks up at you, not down at you, and sees the real you as this beautiful divine spiritual being forever connected to the divine and a few moments later I became aware of myself sliding down the slide and was able to see my own spirit guides to the right and left of me. They were both stunningly beautiful and instantly recognizable. I saw a male and female guide and I felt embarrassed because I forgot they were with me the entire time. But I was able to see them to the sights of me and they helped my body go down the slide and moments later I became aware of all the people who were surrounding my body and when I went to the park and the playground that day and my body was lying on the ground with all the people calling to me. They're asking, Jake, Jake, Jake and I wanted to shake them and tell them I was fine. But it's a little torture because I could see them, but they were looking at my body and recognizing that it was mine. That was not me. It was just a vehicle for the soul of my soul's expression. And I was aware of the people in the park with me, and I became aware of who they really are. Much like God in the spirit realm was able to see the real me, I was able to see their own spirits beyond their personalities and limitations, and it was incredibly divine. I was able to see their auric fields and I was aware of who they are even beyond this lifetime as well as what some of their karma and dharma is and I just kind of got them like an x-ray of their souls. You know, and when I saw an endless array of angels right above my hovering body or as I refer to it, my first book, Life After Breath of Sea of Angels and it was a sea of angels that were literally floating right above me. To describe it, it's kind of like tuning into a radio station, but on either side you tune up that station just a little bit, you have all these things that are right here around you, protecting us and with us at all times that we can't see with our physical eyes, but they're there. And when I was looking at the angels, they were quite distinguished and different from the spirit guides. We were very concerned about me. We had a connection that was very nuclear in nature. Whereas the angels I saw were floating and sending energy, they almost appeared uniform in their presentation. They were quite youthful and were like a golden bronze kind of color, and it's that same kind of color that I saw earlier on, and I almost had to pinch myself because it was just this beautiful filter of angels and it felt familiar to my spirit, but to my three-year-old self, it was an adjustment to see all these beautiful angelic beings. But then, I just familiarized with it, and it just remembered that okay, you know, this is home. I'm here now. And after looking at these angels, I saw that they were just here to serve and send energy with no identities. They were just here as beings and conduits of pure love, protection, and guidance to the earth plane. They had no concept of taking. They were only here to give and to receive, to hear, love, serve, and remember, and to give over love, light, and peace to all that we encounter. A couple of flashes later, I became aware of my own, what's called, soul family, which is kind of like viewing it as a play in which we have different plays in our lifetimes throughout different incarnations and journeys, and we're a part of a similar cast with different plays. Some of the cast members may play multiple roles, such as a spouse and a son, and they may switch between them. And it's all about lessons and learning and understanding different perspectives as well as cultures to make us more of a truly universal citizen that understands everything on the other side of the life that you were living before, to make a more balanced, more informed, more empathic, 
most importantly, spiritual being, but in that moment, I felt quite familiarized with my soul family and similar to my spirit guides. I felt a bit of embarrassment. The decision came from them and it was my decision. So once again, I want to be clear that the thought energy that we still have is still present. We're still processing things. We still have what I refer to as the eternal observer. You know, the soul, which is always, you know, taking things on a deeper level and observing them which is the eye in the window of our soul. You know, life goes on, you know, beyond this, but there's more awareness that really heightens our ability to understand and process things. It may not take as much time and go down as many roads that might take us off the wrong path or misguided paths that we can have in the human experience. But when I looked at my soul family, I felt embarrassed because I just remembered having, you know, and what we call the charting phase of this life. I just remember having all these agreements with my angels and soul family members and all my, you know, inner team. And now all of a sudden, I'm not sure what I'm doing. As in a few years later, I was returning to them. It's as if you have a big party to go into the military and then you come back a week or two later and just say it's not for me. You know, whatever wasn't meant to be. It was a little bit of a surprise. I felt a letdown as if there was more work to be done. And then I was asked by the collective team, will I stay with them with my spirit team and on the other side and continue there as life? Will continue and as we all know, will continue. It's eternal. Or would I continue to work on the life as your old Jake or Jacob and live that life out? And it was the most challenging questions that I've ever been posed in my life. And obviously, if I answer it differently, I wouldn't be here talking to you in front of you here today. I might come through in a medium or something like that, but that might be a different term of our communication here today. But I kind of was wondering if curious about that. I, how will I appear? What can we expect? I became aware of a lot of different faces that I would be speaking in front of and to see why I was here. And in that instant, I was aware of different flashing imagery of the life that I would be doing and the impact that I would be having changes in energy and how much this experience and the work I would be doing impacted them. They also became aware of the various lifetimes that I'd lived. So I had a firm understanding that I know where I'm going, where I'm going, where I'm headed, where I'm infinitely connected to. And I know that I can never die. But that window of the hereafter, I didn't have to wait until I died in this lifetime. I had constant access to it. All of our tasks, I believe, are to bring the hereafter into the here and now in order to truly be true to ourselves as eternal, infinite spiritual beings. Having these human encounters, it's all about remembering in order to bring heaven down to earth. As a result, I close where I am. Was with that decision, with that choice. I had all of the beings leave my awareness in that moment, but I know they can never return. They could leave my heart. They could leave my physical eyes, but I was always eternally connected to them through my own intuition, through my own heart, and through my own inner being. And I knew I remembered that they never left me. I could leave them, but they can never leave me. You could take away everything from anyone, but if you have the power of choice, and by choice, I mean the ability to choose, choosing where you want to focus your mind, and more importantly, your attitude and faith, these are the foundations that will allow your consciousness to expand to new heights. And so I woke up on a hospital bed, you know, with my mother in the room and a doctor trying to operate on me. But I felt an extreme sensation of anger, which as a therapist, I know is an expression of the intensified trauma that I had, the trauma suffocation, as well as the trauma of this incredibly profound transition from a theory role to that has some relevance to this stuff, but not to a deep level. It's now all of a sudden coming back to that through body and I just couldn't look at life ever the same but I almost had to survive and I just recognized that I was different going forward and everything about me was different and so the suffocation of those moments in my near-death experience continued several decades later. They really stopped until I was able to really process and make sense of it all. We're all children's world children of God. We're all their brothers and sisters, keepers here to uplift, not bog down, and to support one another. This game we call life. And so I don't believe it was a coincidence that I had my experience in a playground, that my name was Jacob. Those of you familiar with Jacob was a biblical individual, a biblical man who lived in Genesis in the Bible in the Old Testament. And he fled from his brother Esau, and while fleeing, he had a dream of angels ascending and descending the ladder. As a result, the irony, synchronicity, and tenderness led to a clear understanding. I believe your name expresses your potential as to who you could be. 
It's true in my life and, and inspired me to write my second book. Life After Breath is the title of my first book. The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder is the title of my second book. So similar to Jacob climbing a playground ladder, I had a near-fatal experience. So what I walked into in my near-death experience was beyond my control. But what I walked out of it, the meaning behind it, is entirely within my control. And it's my hope that many listeners can understand the same understanding that we talk into life. And what happens to us isn't necessarily in our control, but how we're able to find meaning from it. The lessons that we're able to have from it, the growth that we come from, it becomes a measure of the meaning that we have within our lives and the purpose that we have within our lives. Some of this sounded familiar. I believe you're all here today due to a sense of familiarity. You're here today to listen because a part of you was involved in a near-death experience, shared a loss of life experience, spiritually transforming experience, or none of the above. There's a part of you that speaks very loudly to you from first-hand encounters. It is my hope that this experience will allow you to take ownership of yourself and your life experience. So the world isn't writing your story for you, but you can write one from a much higher vantage point. Keep writing, keep living, keep searching for the deep meaning within. And don't be afraid to lose yourself because sometimes, in order to find yourself, you must be willing to lose yourself. I know that happened to me. I'm living proof of that, losing my own body and that old self that I had. But I was able to gain a whole new perspective within time, within life, and you can too. So I wish you all love, peace, grace, and thank you for joining me here today. Let's stay in touch. Keep listening to these encounters that can change lives. Believe me. Thank you very much.